This is a podcast about one woman's mission to help entrepreneurs and business owners write better business books. Each week, we tackle your writing excuses, because there are excuses too, and help you beat the blank page of doom so that you can write the book that will grow your life and your business. Now, here's your host, Vicky Fraser. Hello, and welcome to The 1000 Authors Show. I'm Vicky Quinn Fraser, and this is my husband, Joe. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? I'm startled by the fact that I can see my own face on the screen instead of the notes. It's all right. The notes will be there in a minute. Ah. Uh... Well, this is the first time Joe and I have recorded a podcast in about a month, isn't it? It's been a while. Because I've interviewed, I interviewed James Pogson and then I interviewed Yinka. Mm-hmm. And now we're back. It's great to be back. <laughs> is it? Kind of. <laughs> yeah, we're a bit subdued today because we've just had our camping holiday cancelled. And I'm actually really upset about it because I was really looking forward to getting away for a week. Yes. Um, cause we need to cancel those bicycles. tired. Yeah, we do need to cancel the bicycles. Yes, because if you run your own business, then you'll know that you probably have not been furloughed for the last year and a bit. You've probably been working harder than ever. Hi! (laughs) And I am tired. Um, But today, that's not what we're talking about. We are talking about, actually, no, let's do what we normally do. Joe, what are you reading at the moment? Um, I'm reading uh, A Gentleman in Moscow. It's great, isn't it? uh, Which you recommended to me, and it is really good. Yes. Almost nothing happens, but it's beautiful. Yes. I know. It's just beautifully written and the characters are like rich and real and... It's, it's almost like because there's not much happening, there's time and space to like flesh everybody out properly. Yeah, that's really lovely. Really, really good. Really good. good. I'm really glad you're enjoying it because yeah. otherwise I would have had to have done something about that. <laughs> don't know, don't know what. Found a better husband. <laughs> Um, and I am reading, currently I'm reading Night Watch by Terry Pratchett, which I have obviously read before, but I'm reading the hardback. Why are you reading that? Why? What did you read before that? Oh, okay. So yeah, before that I read um, The Last House on Needless Street, which is brilliant. I loved it, but it was a lot. It's pretty pretty serious, isn't it? Yeah, it was. Um, I can't even really say what it's about because that will kind of spoil it. Um, and I had an idea of what it was about. It's is it a horror? It's not a horror. It's kind it's, of like a murder mystery. It's, yeah, it's a murder mystery. It's it's really disturbing in places. It's beautifully written, um, and it's just great. I lo- I loved it. I loved the book. Um, but it was I, I needed something that I knew I would really enjoy. Something that wasn't going to upset you. <laughs> yeah, something that wasn't going to upset me. <laughs> Um, and so I am reading Night Watch by Terry Pratchett, which I love because it's a Sam Vimes. Um, <clears throat> it's a Night Watch. It's about the, the Night Watch, mm-hmm. funnily enough. Um, and it's a bit time travelly, and it's just it's great. So cool. I, and I love I, I love that. So that's my fiction read, and my non-fiction read at the moment is Word Slut by um, Amanda Montel, which okay. is um, a feminist guide to taking back the English language. Joe's going to wave it at the camera for those watching. Um, yeah, it's also a nice bright yellow colour. But I love it because it's linguistics and it's language and it's um, feminism and it's fulfilling my social justice warrior, you know, stuffs. And it's really good. It's really interesting. So if you're in, even remotely interested in the origins of words and how language is used to manipulate and oppress, um, give it a read. Cool. Yeah, it's really good. Um, so yeah, this week at the Dingle, what have we been doing well? I have finally got around, well, I've, I've run out of things to procrastinate um, around the skirting boards in our bedroom. Which, by which he means I berated him until he went and started it. Because it wasn't even that you didn't want to do it, you were just really worried that you were going to screw it up. Skirting board time. So, I mean, skirting boards are not normally like a massive drama, but we've got weird walls with bits of timber in and lime plaster and nothing straight and there's no 90 degree angles and the skirting boards have to be laid like horizontally instead of vertically and there's just all kinds of quirks crazy shit that needs doing to make it work and the skirting boards are solid oak and they're not they're not like wildly expensive when you compare it to say our windows but they're not cheap either so i think you were just really worried about messing it up weren't you well i mean i'm in no way shape or form a woodworker Um, I have limited tools, no experience, and basically a piece of paper and a pencil and a jigsaw. And yet... So I'm kind of making up 
how to do it. But you've done the little. So he's, he's done a little bit so far at the top of the stairs, and it's absolutely beautiful. <sighs> it's absolutely beautiful. It fits perfectly. It's beautifully. Anyway, I you've mean, done it, a brilliant job. It took a day to get about. 14 inches around a couple of corners. I mean, yeah, it wouldn't be a viable career for for you. No. <laughs> but, but you know, <laughs> DIY and furlough projects, it's brilliant. Yeah. And I'm really, I'm really tough with this. We people. shall see. We shall see. So, yeah, we also have jackdaws who were trying to break into our house, um, like Ugh. literally kicking a hole in the soffits and digging out the insulation and stuff. And so we put, had to put a stop to that. And so Joe built them a little jackdaw nest box um, mm. out of old roof slates. And they immediately moved into it, which is awesome. And so now we've got a pair of jackdaws nesting. And just FYI, jackdaws are cool. They're really clever. They mate for life. And they're going to be raising baby jackdaws, which I'm going to tame and then have on my shoulder like some kind of a manic cross between um, Snow White and Edgar Allan Poe. Good plan. Yeah. So I'm going to do at some point I will be doing podcasts with my jackdaw on my shoulder. <laughs> it's going to be great. Um, cats are going to love that. I don't, th- I don't think the cats should take on a jackdaw because they've got big, strong beaks. Jackdaws are pretty meaty. Yeah. Um, and vegetables. We've got vegetables growing. Loads of ve- I lost a few of my 75 tomato plants to the frost, even in the greenhouse. Yeah, we, um, had, we had a couple of really hard frosts, just like and shock frosts and snow and stuff. And yeah, all about. greenhouse didn't like that. But yeah, all of my lettuces are coming up. My cucum- Some of my cucumbers, the ones that have survived, are going to be super strong. Mm-hmm. Um, celery's got all sorts of stuff. It's the cool. front of this Peas. office is sprinkled with wildflowers. And they're all coming up. They're all starting to come up. Oh, lovely. Very exciting. Um, of course, the rest of the dingle looks like a shocking mess, but that's fine. <laughs> We're doing it in tiny stages. Tiny beetle steps. Much like writing a book. Did you like that segue? That was, that was smooth. I know, right? Almost didn't notice that one. I know. And so today I thought I would talk about outlines, the truth about outlines. That I'm going to give you. Okay. So I think there's a lot of misconceptions about outlines and there's a lot of people who will tell you, you have to do an outline before you start. Um, And other people who say, don't do an outline, it won't help you. And neither of those two things are true. (laughs) And so I just wanted to run through a few of the myths. Myths about outlines. So let me just turn my page. There we go. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So I have nine myths about outlines. Myth the first. Hang on a minute. What? Define me an outline. What's the outline? What's it for? Who's it for? Why? What? Well, I mean, if we're going to define outline, then it is like a pencil outline, like a chalk outline. Think of when they drew chalk outlines around bodies. Right. So your book is a dead body that doesn't exist yet. (laughs) And we're just drawing the chalk line. (laughs) Yeah. But, 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 but it's also, it can be like, if you think about a tree with its branches on it, or... A book is a dead tree. A map. That needs a... <coughs> okay, so an outline is is just the, the skeleton of something, right? It's just it's just the bare bones of something. It's a very simple version of the thing that you are talking about. So if you're talking about a picture, it's like if you're going to start to draw a cartoon, it's just like really sketch very quickly and roughly an outline. This is where the head will be. Yeah, this is where the head will be. Here's a hand. Here's another hand. Here's a foot, another foot, and they'll all be in approximately the right place. Okay. Maybe not even the right place. Maybe there'll be a foot on a head. Possibly prone to moving. Yeah. At a later date. Okay. Yeah. And so there are different ways of doing outlines, and I wanted to talk about a couple of different ways, and I will do that in a minute. I'm going to give, we're just going to do three methods of doing an outline, but I want to focus on one specific method that people don't really talk about very often. Um, okay. But we'll come to that in a moment. So I just wanted to run through a few myths about outlines. So myth the first... Um, the outline must be the first thing that you do. No, not necessarily. I do think that writing the outline first is a good, really good way if you're like totally stuck and you've got real bad writer's block and you're like, I just, I, bleh, I don't know what to do. It's like, I will encourage people to write an outline of sorts mm-hmm. because that gets rid of that blank page thing and it gives you a place to start. And one of the ways in which I teach people to do outlines um, is you can end up with basically your whole book like in quite a lot of detail just in note form so that all that is required then is to take a section of it and expand it and flesh it out and turn a few turn, turn 20 bullet points into 20 pages yeah and that is a legitimate way of doing things um 
not every it doesn't suit everybody um so i won't force people to do it but uh, but yeah that is a really good it can be a really good thing to do but not everybody works like that like i know people and sometimes i work like this myself i know people who just sit down and start writing they pull stuff out of their heads mm -hmm. um, empty their brains onto a piece of paper that is really legitimate as well and um, but i will always get people to go back and create a skeleton outline at some point because they are really really useful for other reasons as well i'll okay. come to that in a minute so um so yeah it does not have to be the first thing that you do you don't have to do it first no kind of helpful no myth the second um, that an, an outline is something that you have to stick rigidly to throughout the writing of your book. No. False. If you think of an outline like that, then you will really struggle to get your book written because books take shape as you write them, um, as you put the stories in, as you realise, oh, I need to add something, or oh, that doesn't really fit anymore, I need to take that away, or oh, you know what, actually, I think it would be better if I went in this direction instead of mm -hmm. in that direction. So yeah, you don't have to stick to it rigidly. Um, related to that, myth number three, it can't change. It's written in stone. No. Um, it's, for me, an outline is a living, breathing document that will change throughout the writing process. Um, and I, I'm always really careful to go back and alter and change and add and take away from my outline as I use it because it's it's not just, for me, it's not just there to um, help me get the book started. It's also really useful when it comes to editing as well. Okay. Yeah. So, um, myth the fourth, outlines stifle creativity. And this is kind of related to um, setting boundaries and having a tidy desk and all of that stuff that people, people will say, oh, you can't possibly be an artist or creative if you're super tidy because, um, you know, you're stepping on the creativity man. And I, in my experience those people don't tend to get an awful lot of stuff done. <laughs> um, so if you say to me, you can write about absolutely anything, I am probably going to write about nothing. Because mm. for me, that's like, how how do I choose? So an outline has the opposite effect. It does not stifle creativity. Actually, providing boundaries increases creativity. It increases your ability to come up with ideas. Because you might not end up, and this is kind of related back to the previous myths, just because you've got an outline doesn't mean you need to stick to it, but it's a starting point. Mm -hmm. And it gives you a place to jump off and it gives you a place to think, oh, hang on, what if I stick those two ideas together and then I could go and do that thing over there? Does that make sense? Yeah. I, 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 if, if you don't have an outline, then how do you know, you know, where, where this marvellous anecdote that you've got, where, where's that going to go? Mm. You know, are you going to do that now? Is it page one? Is it chapter three? Where, where does it go? Where, how do you, how do you structure anything if it's just, if you just go stream of consciousness onto paper? Yeah. It's going to be messy, isn't it? It is, which is why I am a big fan of doing an outline at some point, but it doesn't have to be the first first thing mm. you do. So I'm working with somebody at the moment who is writing their book and they are at the moment just in the stage of just getting stories out on, onto paper and they, they know what their book is going to be about and they, they know why they're writing it and all the rest of it. They don't know what they're going to include yet, so they're just like getting everything down. It's emptying their brain onto paper and giving it, they'll give it a good shuffle at some point when they have a plan. Exactly. And at some point, I'm going to get them to sit down and think about this outline so that we can then take everything that's there and think, how is it going to fit in? What are we going to use? What are we going to not use? Mm -hmm. um, all of that kind of stuff. I guess, I guess the danger of that is there's going to be a whole bunch of stuff that they're writing right now that doesn't go in the book. Yeah, but that's but that's fine, and that's a really good. And this is kind of not really related to outlines, but like I say to people, one of the things that we do is we censor ourselves mm. when we write because we're like, oh my god, you know, is this the right thing to be writing? It's like, no, the first draft is for you. Just because you write it doesn't mean you have to publish it, and that's really important because a lot of the stuff that I write, there ain't no way anybody else is going to see it because it doesn't it doesn't paint me in a very good light, um, or it's not you know it's not. Um, it's just not interesting to anybody else or it's just really too private for me to want to put out there mm -hmm. for other people. But I want to write it down because that's going to spark other ideas. So like I might have a really private story that I'm like, I'm, there's no way I'm going to share this in all its gory detail, mm -hmm. but I want to write about it. So how am I going to take some of the elements from this, from this story, from this experience of my life? And how am I going to put that in my book in another way? So yeah, just because it's down on paper does not mean that anyone else ever needs to see it, but get it down there. And I think that's one of the things that writing without an outline can help you do. Because you can just, because you're not, you don't have those constraints. It's like, oh, what do I want to share with people? What don't I want to share with people? Mm -hmm. um, you don't need to worry about that because nobody's going to see it. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Number five, myth number five is that you have to have a, an outline. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have an outline, kind of. Um, this is one that I'm like, mm, 
you know what? I'm not going to tell somebody how to write a book in terms of this is the only way to do it. There are many, many ways. There are as many ways to write a book as there are people writing books, right? Mm -hmm. You don't, if, if somebody is really resistant to writing any kind of an outline, that's fine. But having said that, you're going to need some kind of a structure at some point for all of the reasons that we've just talked about. Uh, there are people who, it's, it's called kind of discovery writing um, or writing by the seat of your pants, some people call it. Mm -hmm. um, it. It can work really well with fiction because you're kind of discovering where the story is going. It can work with nonfiction as well. Discovery writing is like, oh, I'm just like discovering what stories are coming out. And that's great. At some point, you're going to have to do a, an outline. So I guess this is related a little bit to it must be the first thing that you do. Sure. Um, that, that does need to be some kind of a structure because otherwise you're just not going to know what to do with all of the words that are coming out of your face. So, <laughs> um, you end up with Ulysses by James Joyce. And as we said before, nobody really enjoys reading James Joyce. So. <laughs> um, like, honestly, prove me wrong. <laughs> I know that some people will yes. say they it's enjoy a Ulysses. It's a marvellous, marvellous, marvellous work. <laughs> Well I know, I'm probably committing like literary heresy. It's like, I'm a writer. How I'm, I'm supposed to say that I love Ulysses by James Joyce. I don't. I did not get past the first few pages and I'm not even sorry. Um, <laughs> um, myth number six, that there is a right and a wrong way to outline. No, you can write whatever kind of outline or create whatever kind of, kind of outline works for you. Could be a mind map, could be a spreadsheet, could be... I don't even know how you would go about a spreadsheet, but you're like the spreadsheet king, so I'm sure that you would be able to use a spreadsheet really well. Um, there's tools like Jinko that I used to use. Pen and paper. I do my outlining with a pen and paper, or these days with a remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, but that's how I do mine. But there are you can do it with bullet points, you can do it with sticky notes on a piece of paper, like different coloured sticky notes. Easy to shuffle things around. Like these, easy to shuffle things. I do love, like, I love my sticky notes. Different coloured sticky notes. They're not so good for outlines. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah a sticky note that's big enough for you to write you know a few words on mm -hmm. good. anyway so yeah there is no one right way to do an outline and there are no wrong ways to do an outline either you can whatever suits you uh, myth the seventh you have to know what you're going to write before you start no you don't it helps to have a vague idea but quite often we find out what we're going to write about as we write mm -hmm. and that's perfectly acceptable too um myth the eighth related to outlines. You have to write your shitty first draft in order, from introduction to conclusion, all the way through. No. For me, that is one of the fastest ways for people to get stuck. Mm -hmm. And actually, I recommend that people write their introduction at the end, because you don't really know what the book's going to look like until you've finished it. So how can you write the introduction? Yeah. Um, sometimes I get people to just start, and it's like, okay, um, this is what I think I'm going to write about, blah, blah, blah just to get the first bit down. And then you come back to the introduction later and you're going to need to rewrite it. Yeah. For sure. Um, so yeah, I just tell people to start, you know what, what is the chapter that you're most excited, or what is the story that you're most excited about telling? Start with that. Um, get cracking. And then I usually encourage people to do the one that they're least looking forward to straight after it. Mm -hmm. So that they can kind of get those two things out and then everything else is going to everything be... Everything else feels pretty pretty easy after that. Well, I wouldn't say easy, but yeah. <laughs> um, so Yes. You don't have to write it in order. You can write it in whatever order you like. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever gets the work done, basically. And a myth, the ninth, that you have to do an outline to be a good writer. That's one of those snobby bullshit myths that really irritates me. It's like, oh, well, you're not a proper writer if you're not doing an outline. Is there, is there a, a case for an outline if you are talking to, um, like, publishers? Do they want to see an outline? Yes. Do they want to see a specific outline? Do they want to see a particular format or...? Yeah, so there are very specific ways in which publishers want to see your um, book proposal, it's called, right. uh, which is a monster document in itself. It's usually about 40 pages. It's almost like writing the whole damn book again. Um, you don't have to have finished your book before you send it to a publisher, but they will want to see a couple of chapters and they will want to see a detailed outline of it. Um, and this is... A, a little bit off scope, but if you are wanting to be published by a publishing house and for, um, you know, when I set up my publishing house, which will be up and running by the end of this year, I'm very excited about it. Um, I will have, they, they all have submission guidelines, basically. So mm -hmm. you can go and have a look at their submission guidelines. Um, a lot of publishing houses won't even look at you without an agent. So you'll need to get an agent, which means you'll need to write a query letter, which will also involve outlining your book in some way. 
And then an agent will help you to the whole function of an agent is to help you get a publisher so they will walk you through all of that stuff. Um, but for me, when my publishing house opens, I won't require people to have an agent, but I will require them to follow all of the submission instructions. Yes. Um, one of which will be, I want to see some kind of um, an outline or structure for your book. But again, publishers are well aware that that stuff changes. Mm. And so it just needs to, because like when I put my submission in to work with Audible to write that's what she said, I had to provide them with a detailed outline. That changed. Of course it did. The order changed, um, some stuff came out, some stuff went in, but they need to know that they're backing us an idea that is sound and that they know more or less what they're going to get. Mm. I suspect as well it also acts as a little bit of a pre-qualification. Um, you know, you're not just kicking the tyres, you've actually put some work in. Yeah. Yeah, because if you come to somebody, and this is, by the way, this is where a book coach can really help because this is where I work with people quite often is that they'll have a vague idea and they want to write a book, but they're not really sure what, where it's going to go, all the rest of it. That's my job. That's that's mm-hmm. for me to help people do that because uh, that's a re- actually a really difficult thing to do, um, you know, to come up with your idea and then be like, is it going to work? And, you know, a lot of what I do is validation and as well as helping people get clarity um, and tweaking the idea and all the rest of it. Um, But that sort of thing, you need to have that done before you approach a publisher or an agent. So you need to make sure that you know what you're writing about and who you're writing to. And that goes for fiction and nonfiction. Sure. So, um, so yeah. But yeah, that was kind of, I don't know if this was kind of related to myth number nine, which is you have to do an outline to be a good writer. No, you don't. Not everybody does an outline. So there you go. Okay, so those are... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> those are um the my nine kind of major myths there are a bit of crossover there about outlines so what is an outline i have three methods and seven minutes so i'm very quickly gonna say first method table of contents exactly like it sounds you're gonna sketch out what you're gonna include in your book bang 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 underneath each of those um chapter headings you're gonna be like okay so i want to include these three main points mm-hmm. that's your table of contents method I will, there is a lot more to it than that. And it's something that I talk about in my book, How the Hell Do You Write a Book, which is available from my website and on Amazon. Um, (laughs) Hashtag drag race. Uh, (laughs) Not hashtag drag race. Hashtag moxie books. Um, So yeah, you can, that, that is a good way of doing it because by the time you've done that, you just need to kind of sit down and fill in the blanks almost. Yeah. Um, There is the hero's journey method, which is, you know, the classic kind of, and this will, this is more for memoir and autobiography and stuff like that, but still good for stories that you're telling within your book. Um, you will have, you know, this is, what problem have they got to overcome and how do they change along the way? And, and, mm-hmm. you know, and, oh, what was that setback? And, oh, they've been knocked down to rock bottom, but no, they've come back up. Oh, now they're really hitting rock bottom and how have they changed and what have they achieved? And, you know, that kind of thing. So there's the hero's journey method. And then number three, which I would just like to spend a couple of minutes on because this I find is a really great way to get people started and get people knowing what they're going to write and how without being too overwhelmed by writing this really detailed Mm -hmm. outline is the reader's journey method. Okay. And it's really simple. So we're thinking about where is your reader at the start of the book? So your reader has just picked up your book. Where are they? What frame of mind are they in? What can they do? What are they struggling with? Or what do they aspire to? Because it's not all about solving people's problems. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's about, you know. Helping them achieve goals. Helping them achieve goals. Um, so yeah, basically, where are they? You know, what are they feeling? What are they thinking? What are they able to do now? What are they not able to do at the moment? Um, why have they picked up your book? Think about it from the reader's point of view. Because you already know why you're writing your book. You know where your expertise is. You know your reasons for writing the book, what it means to you, what you want them to do next. But what what did they want? What's what's your reader doing? Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. Write as much or as little as you want about that. Just scribble a bunch of notes about it. And then think about right at the far end of your book, where is your reader when when they're finished reading it? What do they feel? What do they think? What are they now able to do having read your book? Which is kind of related to the big promise that you're making in your book. So where are they starting? Where are they finishing? Simple as that. And then you can put the signposts along the way from one to the other. Exactly. And then you have waypoints. So to get them from this point at the beginning to this point at the end, what do they need to know? What do you need to tell them? Mm -hmm. Doesn't need to be in any particular order at the moment. You could be like a spaniel doing laps and squiggles. But, you know, for example, um, for me, I'm I'm like proper meta, meta brain exploding now because I'm writing my next short book on this exact 
topic, the reader journey. So I'm like, oh, okay, so what do they need to know? They need to know a few myths about outlining mm -hmm. and outlines and what an outline is. They're going to need to know where they are now. They're going to need to know where they're going to. You see, this is where my meta brain explodes because I'm like a universe within a universe within a universe. It has all gone a bit inception. <laughs> um, yeah. And now I kind of should have used a different analogy because I literally, I'm not going to be able to write this book, am I? <laughs> my brain's going to, going to explode. Um, so yeah, um, let's think about, I want a, I want a vegetable, a raised vegetable bed that is like mm -hmm. productive. So where is my reader? It's like, oh my God, I don't even know how to build a vegetable base. Like, I, I want to do this thing, but I don't know anything about seeds or vegetables or soil. I don't know or... how to build it. I don't know how to kill the grass. I don't know yeah. where to get the soil from. I don't know what I'm to plant. I'm very confused because there's a lot of things that I have to do. Um, but what I want is a beautifully neat and productive vegetable bed with rows of beautiful lettuces and peas and all of that kind of thing. And I want to be harvesting my fruits and vegetables at the end. And mm -hmm. so I've got to get my reader from here to here. So what are the things I need to know? They need to know what kind of a thing can I plant my, you know, the actual physical structure of it? Um, what kind of soil do I need? How often do I water? How do I plant? When do I plant? How do you organise your planting? Um, when do you harvest? How do you take care of, you know, pests and things like that? What about companion planting? So all of those things, that was not in any order and that was not in the right order, but all of those things will need to be waypoints along the way from getting me from, I don't know what I'm doing about vegetables to, oh my gosh. I've got vegetables. I've got vegetables. <laughs> And it can, you know, that was really simplistic. And I would go into a lot more detail about what my reader was thinking at the beginning and all the rest of it. Mm. But that is essentially it. So what's the takeaway, Joe? Uh, what is the takeaway? Um, I think, what is the takeaway? Uh, think about your outline as a living, breathing document that will help you write and edit your book. Yes. And think about it from the reader's point of view. And that will give you a really basic, simple outline mm. that will serve you and your reader. And it will get you started. And then you can want meander off in a different direction if that is the right thing to do. That's fine. Yeah, take stuff out, change it. Yeah. Cool. So next week, coming up next week, um, we may or may not be talking about setting a writing intention and sticking to it. We'll see. Um, but more excitingly, the second Moxie Books Write Night is happening at the end of April, Thursday, April 29th at 8 p.m. this time. So it's a little bit more civilized. 8 p.m. BST. Until midnight. Yeah, 8 p.m. UK time. Um, be there or be square. Um, people are signing up. It's very exciting. What? Be there or be square. Sorry. Come what? <laughs> <laughs> um, you can go to moxiebooks.co.uk forward slash write night. Um, join us. I would love to see you there. I will send you everything that you need to get the most out of your write night um, in advance. I'll, there'll be a worksheet. There's a worksheet. There's things to fill in. Um, it's going to be really good fun. It was really good fun last time. Last one went really well, didn't it? Did go really well. Um, follow me on Instagram at Tiny Beetle Steps for all of the details and to see what other people have said about it as well, because I'll be sharing lots of little comments and nice things that people said about the last one. Cool. And you also get really cool um, swag and rewards afterwards for attending it, because I love sending people stuff. <laughs> right, i got to go, because it's midday. Love Thank me. you so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this, leave us a review, share it with your mates. That's nice. um, and thank you very much, Joe. We'll be back same time next week. Ta-ta! No Bye! Thanks for listening. You can find links and show notes on the website at moxiebooks.co.uk forward slash podcast, where you can also sign up for the best daily emails in the multiverse and find loads of free resources to help you write your book. We'll be back the same time next week with more tales from the book writing trenches and the latest on what the tiny sheeps have been up to. Mm -hmm.